the on. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, well, thank you for joining us today. We're sorry we're a little bit late starting that webinar. We had to fix some uh, technical connection issues, but we have now everyone connected. I'm Rafael Martinez, and I'm the team lead for uh, the Education Policy and Learning team at the Global Partnership for Education. Uh, we have uh, around the table in DC, Serenat Kivilsim, which is helping us with the webinar series, and we have Marc-Antoine Percier, who's an education analyst in the Education Policy and Learning team. So today we are hosting uh, the first webinar of a series of two on education simulation models. And um, we should, I mean, we probably, you probably all know that in GP we support the development of sound education sector plan and their implementation. So as part of that, uh, the development of education uh, simulation models um, are a very important step for making sure that the plans, education sector plans, are financially sound, um, in tune with demographic trends and economic forecasts. Uh, for the past decade, the uh, community has been supporting uh, developing countries to develop um, simulation models to project um, resources requirements of the system, assessing different policy scenarios, and checking on the financial implications of these policy scenarios. So today we'll have um, IEP, uh, the International Institute for Educational Planning of UNESCO and UNESCO HQ, jointly presenting um, an introductory presentation on simulation models to explain um, what they are and how they're developed and what are the key enabling factors and the conditions for developing useful and effective simulation models. And this presentation will be followed by three country examples um, with Uganda, Senegal, and uh, the DRC. And they will each discuss how they develop their own simulation model, uh, what were the challenges in developing the simulation models, and how did they use the simulation models for informing the policy dialogue. <clears throat> Um, the second webinar that uh, we'll host in March will be mo more um, focused on the actual applications of the simulation models. We're going to start touching on the subject today, but next time uh, we're going to discuss more in depth the, the actual applications and what are the results of uh, developing sound simulation models. Um, you will have the opportunity to ask questions by the end of the presentations. Um, you have an email address where you can uh, send your questions. It's webinars at globalpartnership.org. And you also have the YouTube's live chat function that you would have find in the invitation. The session is recorded for your information and we will be sharing the different resources, the PowerPoints, the recording, um, etc. After the after the webinar, um, I think I'm done with introducing some of the housekeeping issues. Um, yeah, the so now I'm going to turn to IP and uh, UNESCO with uh, Sato Koyano. She's education specialist uh, in UNESCO HQ and Husman Diouf from IIP, and uh, then I will be introducing uh, the rest of the presenters from Uganda, Senegal, and DRC, but we have Jane Nakajubi of online, Czech Bombagay, and Blaise Belisi online. Over to you, UNESCO and IIP, please. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, and good morning. So I'm, I'm Usman here from IIP, and we'll be making the presentation with my colleague Satuko from from HP. Okay, all right. So can we go ahead now, or pass to the? No? Okay, all right. So uh, here we we will quickly in our session make a presentation on the the simulation model when it is used in the planning process. The principle you have been building a simulation model and the main challenges, challenges and 
improvement of the simulation model. And the last point will be about making comparison of some simulation model we have, we have selected, which is developed in countries and here from our institutions also. So I will make the two first point and we'll pass the flow to my colleague Satoko and we'll complement each other. Okay, next. Okay, uh, here, the when do we use a simulation model in the planning process? More often it's after we developed or we formulate the policy priority and strategies we have based on the findings of sector analysis first and program design. From there, normally we develop activities that are meant to achieve the expected results we have set for all programs. And those activities at some point, we will need to, to cost them to see how much we will need as funds. And in the other side, develop the macroeconomic framework and sometimes macroeconomic budgetary framework to see how much money is available for the plan we have and making a comparison between the cost of the activities and the resource available to see if the gap is affordable or, or not. Next. Next. Okay, and uh, here at this point, I think it's once we have the cost of the plan and the resources available from public, private, external, and sometimes also internal generated resources from the education institution, we make the difference between the cost and this financing to have the, the gap. Next. Okay, and this gap will help us to evaluate the consequences or the feasibility of the policy we have set up before designing the, the program and also to make decisions on how do we adjust depending on the priority of the expected results we have set and the amount of money available to achieve our results. Next. Okay, you can go next. So we just go. Okay, all right. And this policy are all about the system itself. It's about high education, teacher salaries you have, TVET, and also equipment and facilities for schools, teaching staff certification, and also all about basic education you have in the in the system. Maybe I can just, uh, these are some examples of the policy interventions a country may be looking at. So we'd like to look into the, how much each policy might cost and also what, what would be the cost of the, the combination of these potential policies. Okay, uh, okay. next. Next. That's next again. Okay, all right, and here is the main principle used in building the simulation model. So first thing we have to, to do is to look at the demography we have in order to cover the school age population. People we need to go to school first time in their life, which is going to be the intake we have and see how they will be flowing throughout the system from primary to higher education, covering secondary, even. And uh, from there, we will have the enrollment, total number of students in the in the system. And after setting some ratio, like number of students for uh, teachers and number of group, pedagogical groups for classrooms and people's textbooks ratio and some other ratio you can set up for what is needed education system that will help us to estimate or to calculate the number of teachers needed in the system based on policy and enrollment you have, number of building and equipment and teaching learning materials. And after this step, we associate it with the unit cost, like salaries for teachers and cost of building and equipment, cost of teaching and learning materials to be able to have the total cost of 
the plan organized or classified by recurrent and capital expenditures we we have and from the other side we use the macroeconomic framework and the budgetary framework to estimate the national resources that are allocated to the education education system and also we have to look at external financing how they are funded and way of estimating the amount of resources expected from from them and in some cases also private financing is captured especially for countries where school fees are paid directly in the in, in the system and all this amount of resource will be representing the resources available for for the plan and compare with the cost of the programs that will give us the financial gap here okay and this financial gap now will be estimated as percentage of the gdp or percentage of uh, let's say budget deficit to be able to know if it's affordable or not if it exceeds the ceiling we go back to the programs and the expected result or amount of expected result try to adjust to be able to have a reasonable or feasible gap and also discuss some policy options we have to be able to set up a final program and expected results that will be in the final draft of the of the strategic plan okay yes next okay and here we'll go to the challenges we have for the simulation or i pass the floor to my okay. colleague thank you simon so and thank you Sato Communist and headquarters so just picking up what you know was saying that uh, most of the countries have used simulation model in education planning in one way or another and then we also felt that uh, there are challenges of countries facing. It, of course, each country is different, and we are going to hear some of them after this presentation. But then we felt maybe some of the three main categories of the challenges many of the countries are facing. The first one is related to data. As this one mentioned in the previous slide, there are lots of data required at the, each stage of the simulation modeling, but often many of the data may not be necessarily available that, or just immediately or directly. Sometimes you need, a, you need to make a lot of assumptions or calculations and they sometimes, and they might be the sort of the classic example of the rubbish in rubbish shops. And without, uh, and, and nothing to do with uh, what kind of model you use. Uh, if you don't, if you don't if you have an unreliable data, the results cannot be, uh, Sort of trustworthy, so unreliable data will lead, lead to the poor projection. And another challenge we relate is related more to the country ownership and the capacity. I think many of the countries have also have an experience that an often the simulation modeling exercise uh, depends on the often case on external specialists and consultants or organizations. And then sometimes countries may not have the sufficient ownership of the results or to actually continue using the model in the country when the adjustments are necessary. So it might, we, we, feel, we fear that it might lead to reduced impact and the sustainability of the model itself and also the policies. And the last but not least, we found also there is some disconnect between the structure of the existing simulation models that we, we have been using and then other documents and other organizational structures, such as education sector plan structure or formation and action, action, action plans, implementation plans, and then more importantly, uh, some disconnect between simulation modeling and the budget organization and the law structure. And uh, so we feel that then it may lead to the irrelevance of the simulation model exercise if they are not really con uh, directly connected to these other documents and exercises. Uh, next, please. So based on that, we, we feel that there are three points or three elements that we could work on on the future simulation model. The first 
uh, we should be working on uh, to improve information systems, including EMIS, to easily provide accurate and timely data for the simulation modeling. We would also like to improve the government ownership of the simulation modeling to address the issues that I mentioned. And also, the, for, to, for the third point, we would like to continue working on creating the links between the simulation models and then ENIS and then also the financial uh, financial management uh, the system so that then all the tools are coherent. And then the next, please. Next slide, next slide, please. And then also just changing the topic a little bit, uh, as I mentioned, most of the countries have been using simulation models in one way or another. And they also are aware that there are several uh, so-called simulation models available. And, and, and we, uh, we wanted to say that uh, most of the models, is, uh, regardless of names we, we call, methodology-wise, they're very, very similar. It's very similar to, it follows, basically follows the diagram of flow that Usman, uh, Usman presented earlier. But then there are some uh, uh, sort of some differences in approaches. The first one we can say there are two different approaches to simulation models that, that among the simulation models that, are, that exist. One is something we call country-specific approach. This is something that we work, we work with the countries to start the, uh, to prepare the model from the scratch. If we create a custom-made model for each country. Another approach is we start with something generic, already prepared, developed, and then try to adjust that to the country's specificities. But there are pros and cons. It's not with black and white, but then there are pros and cons. If you want to do the country-specific approach, obviously we can, we can be very, very specific to the country. And also it can be used as a very uh, in-depth capacity building approach process for the countries. Uh, at the same time, this takes a lot of time and it also requires a quite a sort of substantial um, skills and then competencies and proficiency when it comes to the uh, using a spreadsheet. If we go for the generic model, use something already, already available to adjust. It can be adjusted very quickly. It probably doesn't necessarily require in-depth technical knowledge in either in the statistics or in Excel. But at the, at the same time, it, it, can, it can be said is, is the people can use the model, but without not necessarily understanding the mechanics or how the calculations are made, what kind of assumptions are made. And at the same time, and also the, since it's a generic model, we try to be sort of adaptable. If you look at the back, back end of these models, it tends to be a bit more complicated than the simple Excel file. It could be difficult for the, the users. Next one, please. So another, another difference across all these uh, models, I just wanted to emphasize that there, there are not many Major, major differences when it comes to methodologies. But then we look at the, how we calculate, how we project the number of students, we can say there are two methodologies that are used. First one is something we call flow model. The, the, the number of the students using this model is cal calculated based on the population, how many of them will come to the grade one, then how many of them will be promoted, how many of them will, will be repeating, so it will, it will calculate sort of the flow of the students by grade. Another method in the second one, you can say something called simplified method. We took a chunk of the grade of students, usually it's a level, no? I think um, it's more than uh, talking at the growth and intake rate and then also the retention rate with the cross-sectional ones, not the by grade, and then repeat repetition rate. And then again, there are pros and cons of the each, each approach or each model. So for instance, in flow model, we can have a more accurate, accurate data, uh, but at the same time, obviously we need uh, grade by grade uh, information and the data and the more, more data are needed. And then simplified one, and uh, other way around. We can, we can, the pros can be the few, um, not, many, not, not many data points are needed. So in the country data, availability is not great, 
this, this is something you probably have to use. But at the same time, the results may not be too accurate compared to the flow model. Next one, please. So we just tried to summarize uh, how these existing models would fall under. For instance, if uh, some of them may be uh, familiar with Epsim, the, UNESCO, the one UNESCO has been using, or AMPRO, again, UNESCO has been using, and IIP, uh, we even call IIP model, but then approach that the IIP takes when the, when the, uh, the we support the countries. And then FSSM model, and then and the last one, I don't know, it's like the one you're working on. So there are several ones, but then uh, as I mentioned, Methodology-wise, uh, uh, there are not many differences. What it does is based on the population and then calculate the number of students, and then from that, then we calculate the resources that are required. Some are generic, and that can be uh, adjusted. Some are more country-specific. Some are using the flow model. Some are using the simplified model. But then again, it's, it's really not, uh, not, many, not much difference. And the next one, please. And then having said that, we just uh, just wanted to introduce you to the one of the, the models that then UNESCO has recently launched. And um, it's called the simulation or education model, simulate model. It's based on the EPSIM, but at the same time, uh, it's it's uh, it's using the modular approach. As I mentioned, there are only, there are some some differences. In the approaches, in the, the method of calculation, the simulate doesn't necessarily take one approach, but then it's an option of the approaches. There are different types of the calculations and methodologies that can that can be used. It's a modular. It's a, like a Lego block that then the country can use and select different depending on the data availability and depending on the projection that the country wants to make. It, uh, uh, they, the user can select the methodologies that are most suitable. And then I believe the colleague from DRC will be talking about the experience using the CIMED. And just for information, that uh, it's, a, it's a working uh, sort of tool. We continue, we continuously update, uh, but then the latest model of the CIMED can be downloaded from the link provided. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Satoko and Usman. Uh, we'll now have our first uh, country presentation uh, with Uganda. Jane Nakajubi, she's acting senior economist at the, at the Education Planning and Policy Analysis Department at the Ministry of Education and Sports of uh, Uganda. Jane, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, Good morning and good afternoon. Um, I'll start with the background of projections and simulation models in Uganda, Uganda's education sector. Uh, we have our projection and simulation model is focused uh, is linked to the education sector plan. Uh, once we are when we are working the education sector plan, uh, the models are hinged, the projection and similar models are hinged to the education. It's basically used for costing and projecting the resource needs in the sector, setting targets, and also simulating the different policy options. Basically, we are looking at, uh, when we are developing the plan, we look at where we are, that is, we look at the baseline data, which we use in, uh, as baseline in the simulation model. Uh, where I want to be, we look, that is the targets that we use in the simulation model. And how we get there, that is the projections, the costings, and the different strategy options that we simulate. And the targets that we set that we shall use. Uh, please go to the next slide. Uh, just a background on Uganda's strategic planning process. Uh, we have the national vision, that is the vision 2040, which is the overall plan that we are supposed to achieve by 2040, seeing Uganda becoming a middle-income country. 
and then it is we use the NDP to break down the strategies. NDP is five year period. We have so far developed two NDPs, one ending this this year, 2020, and we are currently developing the third national development plan, uh, and also developing a strategic plan, which is supposed to be in line. The education strategic plan, which we are developing currently, is supposed to be in line with the national development plan three. That is, we break down further the education sector uh, aspirations, which are in the national development plan. Uh, the education sector plan also informs the development of sub-sector sub strategic plans, that is for primary, secondary, higher education. And also we have very many autonomous institutions within our education sector, which hinge their strategic plans on the sector strategic plan. Uh, those are the universities, the examination boards, and curriculum development centers. Um, the next slide. Next, please. The next. Uh, the education uh, uh, strategic process, development process has been already alluded to by the previous presenters. It's the same that we, we follow in the guidance of the Global Partnership of Education guidelines. So I won't go through that slide uh, again. So I request that we go to the next. How do we, how are simulation, how is the simulation model process used in the planning process in Uganda? One, the simulation model process helps us collect uh, different information. Uh, we collect uh, uh, population data, um, student uh, data flows. We collect data on uh, different aspects within the education sector, the equipment, resource needs. And it also helps us to develop and upgrade unit costs. Most of the times we develop unit costs at the strategic plan period in, um, in within, our, within Uganda. So at that time of the development of another strategic plan, that's when we update the unit costs to be used for the next planning period. They also help us to project enrollments and resource needs to the sector, the facilities, the teachers, and also it helps us to cost and trade off different options. We have very many policy options. We have uh, many uh, presidential pledges. We have very many manifesto promises. We have many policies which are developed, but using the different uh, the, the strategy, the simulation models, the projections and simulations, we, we look at, uh, we weigh these policy options and we get those that are best to lead us to achieving our targets by the end of the strategic period. Um, uh, the other usefulness to the, uh, the, the simulations is they give us the insight of, of the whole education system. Currently, we are developing our strategic plan, but when we looked at, we analyzed the flow rates. Uh, for example, we looked at the, we have technical vocation, education training, P7 schools. But when we analyzed the flow rates, we realized that these children join technical vocation at 13 years, and they have to graduate at after three years, which is 16 years, which is below the required age for to join the labor market. So Jane, we, are, we have gone back to the Jane, drawing board to discuss that. Jane, so, Jane, hello? Yes? Yeah, I'm yes, sorry. Yes. Yeah, Rafael speaking here. You will have to speak a little bit more slowly because the translators oh. are having a little bit of hard time to translate it right. Thank you. Oh, I apologize. <clears throat> and also, I've already discussed the combinations of inputs and activities to reach the desired goods, and also it informs budgeting. Uh, within our budgeting, that's when we pick unit costs for the, subs, the years of implementation of the strategic plan from the plan. We pick priorities, the targets, then activities, the sequencing of activities to be implemented in the five years of the strategic plan. We, we pick them as we prepare the budgets. We pick them from the strategic plan. Um, next slide, please. I 
I'm sorry, uh, this is the interpreter. We're having a very hard time hearing the presenter because there's a lot of background noise. We apologize. Should I continue? Uh, how was the simulation model developed or how do we develop the simulation models? Uh, this has already also been alluded to by the former presenter. But, uh, and I would like to just highlight that Uganda, we use the flow rates, the flow model, and it's always country specific. We develop our models from scratch. For the last two, for the last strategic plan and the current, the one we are developing currently, we develop using country specific from a blank Excel sheet. That's how we develop our models and it follows the data collection, the situation analysis and uh, indicator setting and priority discussions. Um, I'll go to the difficulties we face during projections, developing projections and simulations for the strategic plan. And the first is availability of data. Uh, we don't have, uh, we last, uh, our uh, management system was last updated in 2017-18. Those are three years back. And that's what we are using as the best data right now. Uh, we don't have uh, data on off budgets and internally generated funds. So financing basically rely on donor fund, external funding data, and also government of Uganda. And also there's a problem with data with pre-primary within, our, our, within Uganda. And there are other elements that are really lacking. Uh, like I've already, I've already said, we are using previous data 2017-18. So all the interventions, update people, teacher, the textbooks we have distributed in the last three years to update the pupil textbook ratio have not been really updated. Um, the data stock also is lacking, especially for post-secondary education. Um, you find that we don't have the, the information on equipment available, equipment requirements by the students, um, how are the instructional materials that are being utilized. A lot of data for post-high education, post-secondary education is lacking. And like I, I was already alluded to, we lack the data between, to split the data of secondary between upper and lower secondary. Then also the unit costs are not realistic. The unit costs we are using... We don't have, we have not updated our interest to know what is really required to train a child to achieve a quality education. So we have, uh, say, capitation grants, we can have 14,000. That is what is approved by the government. But you know how much capitation grant is really required for a child to study through primary education until she, he graduates or sits, completes primary education. Next slide, please. Uh, we are additionally faced with uh, low capacity at all levels of planning. At uh, national level, we have a low capacity. We have a few people within the education planning department who really understand how to develop a simulation model from scratch or even interpret the models, the indicators. Um, so most of the times we need to seek external capacity, external help. Um, then the other issue is also cascading down the simulation models to other levels of government. Uganda is education is decentralized, especially at primary and level. The planning, uh, budgeting, and accounting is also decentralized. So the simulations are applied at the education sector, developing the education sector strategic plan. But the other subsectors, the local governments, the semi-autonomous institutions within the education sector, when they are developing their strategic plans, they do not use the simulation models. They do not use the projections because there is no capacity. And we, at the sector level, national level, we have not supported them because also we don't have the capacity. Um, then also the other difficulty is that the alignment of the plan to the budget. This is so crucial because most of the times we develop the strategic plan and we cannot... We, are not implement, we do not implement it wholly because of the transition between the plan and the budget, and also monitoring is difficult. You find that when we are reporting on the, with the, for the sector achievements, we don't capture exactly what we set in the strategic plan. We don't report directly on what we set in the strategic plan. So there's a mislink between the misalignment between the plan and the budget. 
and even compliance. So when the national planning authority is assessing, you can see that we are scoring low because of that mislink between the plan and the budget. And also the other difficulty is the MTF projections a bit weak. They are not also realistic. Usually they are up, down, and not bottom up, depending on the need of the sector. Um, next slide, please. Um, the lessons learned. Next, please. Uh, one is reliable and accurate data, and we need reliable and accurate data. It's really hampering our development of the model. Even currently, we're a bit stuck because of data. And also, we need to, uh, to develop a strategic plan that is aligned with the budget system. Uh, we shifted from output-based budgeting to program-based budgeting but we are still developing a strategic plan that is informing at output level. We need to focus on results, program level, and the structure of the program budgeting system, and that if we need to, we desire to achieve this result, what are the outputs that we need to achieve, what are the activities we need to implement, what are the inputs that we require to implement these activities. That needs to come out within the log frame and also the projections and simulation model. So we have adjusted our plan to show to develop programs that will fit within the program budgeting system, but still there's still a lag. And also this, the structure of the model can be adjusted to fit desired levels of it, disaggregation. Uh, last, the last strategic plan, we disaggregated our data according to gender, showing all showing flow rates were developed according to female, male by class. So I think it has shown that we can disaggregate our data, whether at decentralization level or using gender. So it's really possible. Then the other issue is that uh, the methods of projections, we have learned that methods of projections differ. You could use, you could cost differently the teachers you require. For example, the previous we costed teachers using the structure of public service, but where the structure is missing, and for some levels, we can do the average salaries. Um, lastly, for the recommendations, next slide. It's my last slide. What should we, what should be improved in the strategic development plan, or projections, and simulation model development? Um, one is to agree is to improve the data collection, the scope and availability. Because in some cases you find that data for primary and secondary is available, but there's no data for post secondary. And also maybe there's data for the main core inputs, teachers, textbooks, but you find that other elements, inspection, the data is missing, monitoring, the data is missing. So we need to expand all data on special needs is lacking. So we need to expand, to agree on which scope or expand the scope. Um, and also we need to agree on the sources of the data because sometimes as, as Uganda, we get data from non-government organization uh, reports, we get data from donor reports, we get data from different sources, school organizations, but we need to agree which is the credible source of data that we need to take while we are developing our projections and simulation models. Uh, then the other recommendation I would give is uh, uh, the priorities along the programs is not enough. We need also to map inputs, activities, like I've already said, according to the budgeting system, program budgeting system. We don't only need to plan according to programs, but we need to show how do these inputs, how do we achieve results from the input level. And then also, we need to develop the documents from the simulation models according to the classification of the budget. If we want, we cannot... We need to budget for what we plan for, but this can only be possible if the projection or simulation models provide uh, doc budget documents according to, uh, according to the budget structure. Because even the M and monitoring and evaluation in Uganda is based on the st is structured within the budget system. So we need the plan, the, the simulation model to provide a document that fits within the budget classifications so that it's easy for uh, planners to transit this information to the budget and ultimately to report on it through monitoring and evaluation. 
And then also the other recommendation is capacity building at all levels, not only at the national level, we need to develop capacity at other institutions within the education sector. Uh, also, we need to update unit costs because they are key in informing the resource need to the sector, informing the gap, and also utilizing them to defend why we need additional resource, to justify why we need additional resource to the sector. Because once you say we need one extra billion for the sector, but what are the unit costs? What are the small components that have come have been merged to uh, to get this uh, to require this additional resource? And lastly, I would recommend that uh, the MTF projections need to be the medium term expenditure framework needs not only to be from up down; it needs to be from bottom up. Then, depending on resource availability, we can narrow it down. But this also needs to look at the existing budget. Um, budget structure that is happy, that is in within the sector because for, if, for the case of Uganda, the medium term expenditure framework is according to vote level, and you cannot move money within. So we need also the simulation model to provide that MTF that can convince ministers to show the resource need or resource allocation to the various uh, institutions within the sector or levels within the sector. I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Jane, uh, for your presentation. Uh, very interesting to see the lessons and uh, what you recommend for uh, developing useful simulation models. Um, maybe we can see if uh, Senegal has the same experience with Sheikh Bambage, who's the head of the Monitoring and Evaluation Division in the Ministry of Education in Senegal. Over to you, Shaq. Could you please turn off all the microphone if you are not speaking? Thank you very much. Shaq, are you online? Good, good morning. I'm going to try to uh, tell you what the work was done in Senegal in terms of the simulation models. Uh, first, uh, I wanted to uh, let you know what my uh, presentation plan is uh, going to be. Uh, so go on to the next, uh, next one. First, we're going to explain the context of the sector plan development process. Uh, see how the simulation model was used in the planning process, see what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the model, and the uh, challenges, as well as the suggestion for improvement. So the context for developing the uh, sectorial plan, next, next slide, please, was done. Next, next slide, please. Next, uh, next slide. I don't see the next slide. The, we don't have the... Senegal developed its uh, new sectoral, sectoral plan. Here it is. Uh, with three levels. At the international level, we have uh, some initiatives such as the um, uh, Sustainable Development Goal, uh, which uh, have been done since 2015. At the regional level, there is uh, the uh, Agenda 2063. And at the national level, we have uh, some initiative, in particular the uh, uh, PSE and the um, consultation effort for the future of education in Senegal. So what we've done is that uh, we evaluated the uh, first phase of packet, and based on this evaluation and on the new uh, international references in the SDGs, the SDG 4 and the, and the 2063 agenda, all of this was used to do what we call the uh, sector plan for Senegal. Next slide, please. Next slide. I do not see the next slide, so, but 
to just give you the context that, that would allow the to develop the model, what we've done is that first we evaluated first phase of the packet, uh, which allowed us to see what were the challenges for the next step. Based on that, uh, we have done what we call the strategic planning. Uh, and this is that covers all of the uh, sector of education and training, and it involves uh, uh, the uh, National Education Ministry, Superior um, High Education, uh, Labor Ministry, and other different ministers. The policy documents allowed us uh, to uh, do the strategic planning all the way until the results and the measure of the results. That is part of an element of the change in terms of planning, uh, strategic planning. All of these elements uh, were assessed independently, and this evaluation was asked by the GPU. So this evaluation was performed, and the result of the evaluation were integrated in a document and sent in the, to the GPE so that the document could be validated uh, by all of the technical partners that finance this, which was done also at the uh, Ministry of Finance in the country. So all of these documents were validated. This was an iterative process, which means that during the process, there was a consultation, and then we integrate the various recommendations that were uh, submitted uh, on the from the, the committee. So that is a very iterative part of the uh, process so that the document could actually comply with the rules of inclusion and shares. Next slide. Now, in terms of the simulation model itself, what we tried to, to do is what were, what were the strengths, the weaknesses, and the opportunities. Next slide, please. Next slide. This takes into account the, um, what, uh, the um, uh, UMOL reform into account. Uh, it allows to link between everything that is to deal with resources from the policy planning, planning, programming, budgeting, financing, monitoring, and evaluation. So this is a, a very strong model that allows to link all of these different elements together. Then there is strengthening of coordination between uh, the budget and finance and the planning directorate. This is, uh, this is a model that integrates, uh, that is integrated in our national uh, budget, and it also informs the policy dialogue. So this allows every party to be able to come in and advocate for its own interests uh, in terms of the activities that were programmed in the plan. So this is the aspect of the different models. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the context of the stimulation model development process, how was it developed? There was a national uh, technical team. We had representatives from the different directorates, from the ministries, uh, from the um, uh, vocational training, from the universities, and for all of these different ministries uh, were uh, United were composing this uh, technical national team with a, a training strategy uh, to uh, be able to develop a, this simulation model. Then we evaluated and diagnosed the situation in our country and on an international level. There was a synthesis of the different models to have a concept node to be able to develop this new simulation model. And based on that, we collected data. And that's how we started to develop the, the model uh, on an Excel sheet. And all of the parameters were actually integrated uh, as we were going. Next slide, please. So what is the process? When you open the simulation uh, model, there is a logical framework that is global that allows to link the uh, national policy and the education policies. So this is the link between those two different elements. Based on this uh, framework, we developed something that allowed to estimate the resources that were available by financing source. What does this mean? It means that 
we try to evaluate between now and 2030, what are the resources that the government could actually give to education? We did this, the same thing for our technical and financing partners, same thing for the private sector, same thing for the funding, um, the funding of education, and then what the local government could actually do at the local level. What were the resources that these various authorities could actually um, uh, allocate to uh, education? So based on that, we basically have model per administration. So different scenarios by South, uh, south sector, uh, subsector. The same thing was done for national education. The same thing was done for for uh, high education, and for you know all the different uh, levels of education. We've defined the different programs, and each program has different objectives that can be that should be uh, fulfilled to answer the logical framework. That means that we have activities and we have actions, and based on these programs, action, and activities, we have introduced what we call the inputs. To realize or to accomplish those different activities and actions, we need some inputs. They were evaluated by unit costs. Those unit costs are linked to those inputs. They are based on the economic and uh, fiscal uh, features, that allows us to, um, to understand what we need in terms of the budget. Once we've defined the inputs and the unit costs, we were able to actually number, put a number to the strategy. It means that the strategy has a direct link to a program and an activity, and each activity has a program that is linked to, as well as a result that is, uh, or an output that is expected. Once we've actually evaluated the uh, global cost of the uh, sector plan, and once we've evaluated the resources that the government, as well as a partner, can actually allocate to education, it allows us to define if there is a shortfall in terms of uh, financing. Based on this strategy and these documents that were defined, and that are available within that model, we can basically have some documents, in particular the pre-annual expenditure documents that are used in the annual budget. We also have a, a document that is a priority action plan for the um, uh, phase of uh, 2018 to 2022 of the packet. Next slide, please. So what are the strengths of this simulation model developed in Senegal? The strength is that, next slide please, is that it allows to have a global uh, mapping of the sector to understand how the budget can be allocated among the different entities, the different administration that exist in the country. That also allows to have a dialogue among between the structures uh, during the planning process, because all of the institutions that uh, are involved in the uh, planning or budgetization have been invited to create this model. So this is a tool for dialogue that allows the various actors to be able to communicate. It also allows to uh, prepare uh, budget programming documents. Uh, uh, based on what was planned. What we've observed is that every time that you, you plan, but it, when it comes to budget, the plan was never taken into account. So this tool will allow to have a link between planning and budgeting through the action plan, which will be done through an annual work plan. So that's the strength. Next slide. Now, what are the weaknesses? It's not really a weakness per se in terms of the model, but in Senegal, the budget allocation for the uh, education sector is done by the ministry. So the National Education Ministry has an envelope, has a certain amount of funding in its budget, uh, and different ministers have you know, different, uh, uh, the minister that uh, deals with uh, the uh, primary education has its own envelope and the, the Ministry of Work has its, you know, labor has its own envelope. So that's a problem. So you cannot have a sector allocation when it's already been done at the ministry level. The second issue is that 
the simulation model, ask for a participatory approach. If all of the different actors were included in the process, sometimes some activities may have been um, neglected within the strategic activity and programming because planning and strategy as well as uh, the budget it, it occurs at the ministry level. So there is a little bit of a uh, of a problem between activities that have been programmed and the budget that cannot pay for those, which means that the activities in the budget plans will be less than the activities that we have in the strategic plan. Recommendation and conclusion, next slide, is that when you when you create a plan like that, the people who are responsible must be involved. If the directors are not involved in the programming, there will be a certain some element uh, that will suffer. Uh, same thing in the budgetization. Those elements will not be included in the budget. Second, the documents that we also want these documents to be a reference for the other ministries in as much as it can help um, uh, the, the post program, which is it's a new approach. It allows uh, Senegal to have public policies that are organized and these programs these the people responsible for this program should participate in all of the planning the planning process in particular for this exercise uh, in terms of the uh, simulation model next slide to conclude the simulation model in senegal is an example it was developed by national actors uh, assisted by consultant that uh, and the model uh, uses the documents that already are used in our countries but the recommendation for this part deals with the involvement of the people who are responsible for this program and this model should be used by other ministries as much as possible, uh, in particular the Minister of Finance, uh, so that there will be a better allocation of the envelopes. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm done with my presentation. Presentation, uh, very good insights as well on your experience in Senegal. I just want to remind the audience that you can post questions uh, on the YouTube um, link channel or uh, through email at uh, webinars at globalpartnership.org. Uh, now we're going to transit to uh, the DRC uh, presentation. Blaise Bellesi, you're the head of the planning and research division of the Ministry of Higher Education in Congo, Kinshasa. It's uh, over to you now. Thank you very much for giving me the floor, Rafael. Uh, hello to everybody. We will present the use of uh, Simu Ed in the preparation of the education and training sector strategy in our country. And uh, the summary has eight points. First of all, we'll talk um, at the, I am in, in the third slide, please. Go to the third slide. Third slide, please. So the background, the background in which we have used the SIM-ED model, we already had a strategy that was developed in 2015, and there we had used EPSIM model to simulate education policies that were to be addressed. 
At the same time, when we were developing our strategy, we also had the SDGs that were being developed. After having validated the strategy, we saw that there were the SDGs that we had to ally with our strategy, especially for the SDG 4. Next, please. But before aligning these two, before aligning these two, so the strategy and the SDG 4, we had to understand and have ownership of our objectives. That's what we did. A team was developed, a technical team was developed with several actors, the experts for all ministries of education, experts from other ministries, budget, finances, and also civil society that did participate and our colleagues from agencies, from the UN agencies, thus. So this was covered, and the ambition, the accent of the SDG, but in response to all the countries, it being applied to all countries, the finances from abroad, and also innovative financing. We all understood, clearly understood, what were the challenges of SDG 4, and we had to adapt it to our context and prioritize the different items in the SDG. So we started the exercise. The adaptation was done. We had priorities established. Everything was understood to reduce, for instance, the ambitions of SDG 4, but also taking into account the constraints that would be local constraints as to the SDG on education. Next, please. Next, please. So we also had this exercise to analyze the strategy in education for SDG 4. And all indicators there, after having reviewed all indicators, we did adapt them, we presented them, and there were no difficulties as to any indicator. We all understood them. And these indicators we saw, we had to cover them through surveys, but we also had censuses in schools that we perform every year. So we understood also that all the targets have been taken into account in our strategy. So the alignment issue was quantitative, not qualitative, because the SDG was more ambition than what we had in the strategy compared to different topics. And they were compared to SDG 4. So the alignment was of the ETSS with Agenda 2030 was essentially a quantitative issue for the SDG, knowing that we couldn't. We had to see how we could cover SDG 4. Next, please. To do so, we started using the models that we had used before. In the development of our strategy, we had EPSIM as a model. We started using these models, indeed. While we were using them, EPSIM 
we saw was not perfectly applicable to SDG 4, given the nature of this alignment exercise, we had to anticipate uh, an evolution that would not be straight. We couldn't be aligned from 2018 until 2030. We had to see how we could have a process that would not be straight away. We would start with the strategy, what were the schemes, then integrate all the items in order to get to SDG 4. The EPSIM model had to be modified. So first of all, we had to show the vocational training, training in lower secondary schools, because before it was not well divided nor specified. And then we have the vocational training that was different from the technical education. But also, we had to show the links between the cycles and see what were the dropout rates, which we didn't have in the Epson model. Thus, we had linked the remedial education to school dropout rates. With EPSIM, we only had figures. for the remedial education, and then an estimate was done on the general demographics to see what were the projections for the subsector. We had to link them to dropout rates. That's what we had to do. And then we had to compute with precision the needs of inclusive education and literacy. We had a lot of uh, errors also that we had to check, and thus we also updated the data that was obsolete, especially everything that was macroeconomic forecast, because in the strategy development we had projections, macroeconomic projections. When we did the alignment, these showed the macroeconomic situation where we were up to 4%. We had to update it. So the EPSIM, thus we saw, was not adapted to take into account all this. Thus we had to go to the simid ed model. That's how we decided with a consultant to use the SIMU-ED model. Next, please. Next slide, please. Thus, the use of SIMU-ED started with the structuring of the education system. We had all the levels developed for schooling, so the sub-cycles, for secondary schooling, and we had primary and secondary cycles that are defined. Then for higher education, we had the different levels of degrees and also for training now. We started with the secondary level where we had separated general, technical, vocational, uh, training and for higher education, we had divided university training, technical colleges, and then training of teachers for secondary schools. Then we had grouped or unified certain categories to facilitate flexibility. And that was for higher education mostly. So we put together all the sections, all the options in five categories. So sciences, social sciences, 
medical sciences, and so on and so forth. We had determined these categories, and then we determined, we defined the length of each level of a cycle. In the system still, we decided upon the age of entering each cycle, and we made the link between all those cycles. Then we defined the different categories, private sector, public sector, and also religious teaching. So in this SIMU-ED model, we defined all the institutions and their categories. Then for teachers, we decided on the categories for each cycle, and we have decided on the qualification level for primary teachers with a specific qualification that is required, then teachers in the secondary, and then for higher education. And then we decided on the categories of administrative staff for each sub-cycle in this whole system. We have organized the structure perfectly, perfectly, and it was validated by all. Now, next. Next slide. Here we are. After having determined the structures for the education system, we had to give data on the on all the education levels. We started with demographics data. We had one challenge here. So was it the UN or our own data that we have to use? We decided upon the UN data because our own data did not go up to 2030, whereas the UN already had projections up to and above 2030. So that's why we use that type of data. For education data, we have updated the education data for each cycle and on all variables. We started with students, pupils, then by level, by cycle, by type of training. Then we have also updated data on schools, on institutions. We have updated everything on classrooms by type of institution. So how many classrooms you had in the public sector, in the private sector, we have updated all that. And we also have uh, uh, updated the number of teachers by type of institution and by qualification or competencies. So for each cycle and by each sub-cycle. Then we have updated the number of classrooms, especially specialized, specialized, which means that we have libraries, we have labs, we have different workshops. So we did update this in the whole education system. Next, next please. With this updating, Based on all these data updated by us, we also looked at the system to see the coverage of our educational system, so staff. We used the gross intake rate rather than the gross enrollment rate which was considered to be the outcome. The variable was for the admission rate or intake rate. We have determined the progression of students from year to next, given the conditions, promotion, repetition, dropout, 
and also the transition between cycles. So we have determined these between cycles, which allowed us to have an estimate and a projection as to pupils and students, which allowed us also to have the number of students and pupils for each year up to 30, 2035, given the different scenarios. So the scenarios were for private sector, for private sector by gender also, and by type of education. Thus, we were able to calculate the number of teachers that would be required for each scenario, for each level, and also the infrastructures, teaching materials, what were the requirements. So all this in the education system was based on projection given the number of pupils and students that were estimated. Next, please. We also had to determine costing to enable us to have an estimate for funding of our sector strategy. We had two levels. For first, for early education, primary, secondary, and then higher education was separate. Why? We saw that for expenditures, for salaries, for teachers, and even administrative staff, we saw that the differences were not significant between early childhood and secondary. So we decided to have a ratio of GDP, so 2.5 for salaries per inhabitant, for teachers, even administrative staff. We also made an estimate for uh, strengthening capacities for teachers through continuous training that we have as an activity in our strategy, the strengthening of capacities for teachers, we put it in the salary, in the global salary total. So a percentage that was linked, linked to salaries and expenditures for training, training of teachers here. Then we also based on the data that we had and the information that we had in all ministries, we have decided the cost for infrastructure, for investments, construction, reconstruction, and refurbishing. We have divided reconstruction and refurbishing because in the diagnosis, we saw that some infrastructures were not heavily involved in reconstruction, but some others would be refurbished, whereas some others would be reconstructed indeed. Led, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, in the interest of time, and if we want to keep a little bit of time for um, having a question and answer session. Can you um, accelerate a little bit on the last slides, please? We here is an estimate. So to go faster, I'll go to projections. 
through the projections on staff for and students and pupils, uh, teachers and others, we had uh, projected all the indicators for schooling, which enabled us to have to do costing. And these are part of macroeconomic projection that we have used. So we had GDP, we had the state budget and the share of education in, in national budgets for current expenditures and investments. And we made an estimation of the gap in funding for our sector strategy. So there is a need for funding that we had to fill to finance our strategy. And then we have decided upon the cost per student for each subsector. And here, here you have the level that is the more expensive for education. It's higher education, higher education, where a student costs is, which would cover 25 primary education students. We discussed it, we determined this after discussing, after modifying policies. This is the figure that everybody accepted and deemed acceptable. To conclude, beyond the rationalization measures that we have adopted to be aligned on the on SDG 4 we had to modify our objectives and try and improve the models that we've used we have one scenario that we have retained and this is for 2020 for the SDG 4, we had other scenarios which were to keep on with the sector strategy and to start with the SDG 4 immediately. So that's what we adopted all as far as strategy is concerned. These challenges, if you don't mind, that we beyond those that my colleagues have already talked about is the use of the model. For the experts, national experts, we did understand how to use it, but it's not like EPSIM. With EPSIM, we could modify to develop ourselves a model, but with SIMU-ED, we have very specific formulas, and we cannot be owners of this model. Technically speaking, we are developing our provincial now uh, strategic plans, so we have to be more flexible to develop these plans. But nationally speaking, the technical ownership of CIMU ed was not up to par with EPSIM. So we would like to have more support in this. And I will stop here. Thank you very much in the interest of time. Well, thank you so much, Blaz, um, for, the, for the very interesting in, uh, presentation. I think. Um, We'll try to take a little bit of time to reflect on questions that we received online. And um, you're discussing about the use of simulations, um, simulation models when you were finishing your presentation. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your experience using the model in your dialogue with your minister, for instance.
our experience. I, I think that the, the question was for me. Is that right? You use the model and the complexity of the model or the simplicity of the model. How do you translate all of the information contained in a model for having an informed dialogue with your minister, for instance, or any other higher level officials, policy makers? Okay. This, this model allowed us to facilitate the dialogue between the different, amongst ourselves first, the uh, national experts and civil society, but it also allowed us to, to facilitate a dialogue with the Ministry of Finance, Budget and Planning. In that, in that respect, we have shown the needs. First, the SDG 4 is very ambitious, so we need to align ourselves. These are the different objectives that we want to accomplish and all the different targets. This is how much it's going to cost in financial terms. So the simulation models allowed us to use information to have financial information available to us to advocate and to have this kind of dialogue. In terms of the sector plan, in terms of the sector, the authorities were completely convinced when we explained to them or when we presented to them the results of these models. That is something that facilitated the adoption of the strategy within the government because the authorities got ownership of it as well as the partners. So many partners understood the strategy. So that really allowed us to have uh, element to respond to all the questions from the partners who were interested by that. We also created an addendum that was added to the strategy that was already created, and the addendum was approved by the government, first by the partners and then by the government. Thank you, Blaise. Um, there is a question about, uh, and maybe it's a question for UNESCO colleagues. Um, I'll have questions for the other country representatives, but um, for UNESCO colleagues, there is a question, um, a technical question, whether with a simulation model, uh, we can carry cost-benefit analysis. Uh, maybe, Usman, you want to respond to this? Yes. Okay, th thank you, Rafael. I, I, I don't get the question. What is the, the model? Can we, can we do the cost? Can we use analysis? simulation? Can we use simulation models for undertaking cost-benefit analysis, or are there okay, like I, another set of tools? Yes. Yeah. No. Exactly. I, I would say. I would say no. Because for cost-benefit analysis, you know, the objective is to look at the benefit of actions and estimate the return or let's say the, the benefit themselves and make the difference to see. But here it's about education we're talking. It's very difficult to, 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 to estimate or to assess the benefit of the actions because it's in the very long term. Then the cost, of course, we can know it, but the return may be measured, you know, in the, in the very, very long future. But one, what the simulation model can help to do is first to look at the priority you have for some expected results of activities, okay, what you want to really achieve, and have a proper costing, you know, going, let's say, much more sophisticated costing where you need all the unit cost and have a detailed formula costing of your activities so that you can link the results and the cost you're going to put the resource you will put. And after that, have some performance indicators that you can measure to see what the link between the results and the resource you are putting. And that can help you only to, to, to have 
a performance measurement framework that can be used at the end after your action. And this is rather on, let's say, financial performance. And we cannot, for example, some externalities will come positive. You, we, we won't be able to measure it after one year spending. Okay, in other words, the cost benefit analysis I mean, cannot be done with the simulation model. You will need some other tools to, to, to do it. And what you can do with the simulation model is rather to, to measure annual performance and budgetary performance we're talking about, not the system performance. Because what you're going to spend, the return after one year, for example, it can only be, you know, entitled to the money you have spent. But the results, for example, if it comes to improving learning, you cannot just after one year expand at your measure and say this was achieved due to what I have spent here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Usman. Uh, thanks for this um, elaborated answer. Uh, there is one question to, to Jane um, for the experience in Uganda. Jane, you said that the medium-term expenditure framework projections were not realistic enough and that you had hard times adjusting the macroeconomic framework uh, for making your uh, simulation uh, relevant. Um, but there is one question about like how uh, the simulation model maybe helped into uh, informing uh, more reliable MTF projections, at least for sector level spending. Um, were there like any type of feedback loop uh, for informing a sector MTF? Um, thank you, this. Thank you for the question. Uh, the simulation model has helped us because the, in a, the inefficiency was both at uh, financing, the financing side, and also the costing side. Like I mentioned, the at the costing side, we had a challenge with the data. If you don't have reliable and realistic data, you couldn't have the right cost and also the unit costs. So the pointing out that we have, uh, it has helped the management of the ministry to refocus on redeveloping the management information management system and also developing a policy that provides for the streamlines the data collection and also uh, you. Puts, uh, puts across sanctions for non-compliance of institutions not submitting uh, the right information. Uh, and it also has, we have also, uh, while developing this strategic plan, we have w worked with the donors, we are working with the donors, World Bank in particular, to help us develop realistic unit costs, which could help us project the costing. But at the level of um, the financing side, uh, we still have challenges with the we have of budget uh, of budget financing from mainly the donors. Uh, we highlighted it to the Minister of Finance because we saw gaps within our uh, MTF, and they have incorporated that in the budgeting system that we require to submit to collect this data from the donors and also the internally generated funds from the institutions. They have also incorporated that as part of government of Uganda funding in the system. So institutions are no longer allowed to, especially universities are no longer allowed to spend the money, the funding, without, the info, without sending it directly to the consolidated fund and captured by the Ministry of Finance. However, still there's a challenge with the MTEF because like I, I, I presented, it's not based on the resource requirements of the sector. Uh, most of the times you find that the long-term expenditure framework is just factored. Uh, maybe there's a 5% increase in wage every year or 5% increase in non-wage. It's not based on the requirements that are developed, um, the sector needs that are developed in the, that are projected in the simulation model. So the gap still exists, though some issues have been addressed. Uh, as we have come along, we're raising them as we develop, we develop our projections and simulations. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. There is another question for Senegal this time about um, data. So, I mean, one key aspect of all of your presentations is that the simulation models can be very data consuming. 
So there is one question about, in the case of Senegal, whether the EMIS produced data were sufficient to inform the model, or whether you had to uh, carry some additional data collection exercises to, to inform the model. Thank you. I think that you've said it, that the issue of the uh, data is a crucial uh, issue because it's from the uh, data that you can actually proceed. So based on the information that we were able to collect, uh, uh, data from the administration, whether in terms of uh, budget or finance uh, or even in terms of school data and the national education with the, uh, the uh, schooling census that we have, as well as the uh, data that we have uh, in terms of the demography, uh, dem demography and, uh, and sc school children, those data are reliable and support the projection that we use for the uh, simulation model. Some of the data that could actually be a little bit difficult or that actually um, uh, are a problem are the uh, data uh, regarding the decentralization. De there are some administration that are located in the various regions and for those, we've had a little bit of uh, problems in terms of lack of uh, data. Um, in, in, we are missing information. We were not able to get uh, exhaustive uh, data. But beside this, I think that for all of the data that we use, we were able to get all of the uh, necessary data to be able to have enough to uh, for the, the macroeconomical simulation. So I think that... Um, it's not a major issue that we've had uh, uh, during the process. Uh, also, uh, there is a part of the uh, data that uh, come from the uh, financial partners. We do not know what they will be beyond four years, so we took four years' worth of uh, da data to feed the uh, sector plan. So we assumed that what they're doing right now they will do the same thing within until 2030. So these are this is the the kind of answer that I can give you regarding the question you just asked me. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. And since uh, you have the floor, maybe an additional question on something a little bit uh, different. But um, but um, the question is about updating the model and to what extent the model is used as a recurrent tool for informing monitoring, for instance, checking that targets have been achieved and uh, that the financial forecasts, for instance, uh, were uh, relevant enough. And so are you using the model when you're uh, monitoring the performance of the system? And, and to what extent do you have a recurrent uh, process for updating the data as you get the new data batch for each school year. It's a difficult question. It is an important item. Each year, for the uh, training and education sector, we develop a yearly performance report for all the items that were achieved or the indicators that were achieved during this time. During the, in this document rather, the data linked with performance show that we have stabilized and the targets are used in the simulation model. So the reference for the years is the model. For each year, we do a comparison what was performed in our systems and those that were offered in the simulation model. And there should be a time where the model items should be updated compared to the data that we receive each year, which means that for 2019, everything that we have performed should be integrated in the simulation for the next year so that the model uh, would produce new targets that would be pertinent or adequate for the projections that we have in the model. As to the simulation model, this is an instrument that we use often, as I said 
earlier in the performance report, we have to have the targets that are in the model, in the simulation model. Now, the updating is an issue uh, compared to what we have done each year. And this is something that we haven't performed yet since we have the simulation model. But these are works that we will be doing in order to update the data in the model. Now, with the data, with the model rather, uh, enable us to follow the education policy, this is the main role of this model since everything that we do should, be, should come from the model. And when we perform, when we have results, we have to compare it to the model, what was stipulated in the model. For the funding, that's another issue because what is planned most of the time would be in the budget. It's only a share that we have in the budget, so there is a gap there. And with time, the gap will be filled, and one day we'll have to update the model for this new item. After a few years, there will be a gap between programming and planning. We are very aware of this, and we're working on it so that there would be a correlation between what we've planned for the level of results and what we have as a budget for funding. Most of the time, planning goes well beyond what we have in the budget. So I think that this is something that we have to monitor and maybe update or modify. Thank you. Thank you, Shaq. Um, I have a question for UNESCO colleagues, but um, um, I'm just giving it to you right now so you have time to coordinate who wants to answer the question between Satoko or Usman. It's a technology question. So the question is about like whether you have plans to develop web-based applications uh, for simulation models rather than having these bulky Excel-based sheets, etc. So um, I'm leaving it. Uh, to Satoko and, and Usman to decide who is going to answer. But before that, I'm turning to Jane, because there is a question on capacity gaps. So all of the, 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 the three countries mentioned capacity gaps, and, and, and we wanted to understand a little bit better, like what type of capacities you think, in Uganda in particular, you would need to reinforce or develop for uh, making this process smoother, um, easier. And, and, and maybe like also like better used in some ways. Is it um, with statistics? Is it more like with IT Excel? Is it more with planning concepts or anything else? Um, thank you for the question. Um, the capacity gaps are not necessarily statistics or IT or Excel. Uh, but it's planning, education planning, projections and simulations. Uh, you, find, you find that in the whole department we have few people, two people in particular who can ably develop the sim projection and simulation model for the entire sector, actually for the entire sector, and also like three people in the department can follow what you've developed in the sector. And this we cannot support other, um, most, given that the Excel sheets are, are big, and most of, the, most of the staff lose interest because of the uh, lot of the load of work and how big the Excel files are. So planning concepts are important, but um, to be taught to the staff, but also at the level of management, explaining what has been devolved from the simulation model, discussing with sub-sector managers. It's also complicated because the planning, the education planning concepts are lacking um, with some of the managers. So it's really difficult uh, to develop the models as you're only very few who understand what is really running in the model and also to explain to the managers who don't have the, the knowledge on education planning. So I think that's the capacity that we really require. Otherwise, other planning within the ministry, other than projections and simulations, we do it using the Excel files. We, have, we use statistics on the day-to-day -day basis and also IT. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jane. So, um, Usman and Satoko, uh, who wants to answer the question and, and maybe an additional question on our side, which is like, how can we basically work the simulation models in a way that it's easier to, to be read and used by policymakers themselves? Or do we always need some uh, colleagues to make the go between between the technical and the political worlds? Thank you, Raphael. Uh, I can start, and then maybe Usman yeah, can exactly. join. Uh, thank you very much for, for this question, because for us, the answer is yes. We would like to explore the possibility of actually moving, not going beyond Excel. Looking at, I think, uh, one of the points that then we mentioned during our presentation in, in terms of the futures, that like we would like to have the better linkage with other tools. And then we are looking at, for instance, EMIS. How we can actually enhance EMIS, existing EMIS, uh, so that we can, we can generate some more projections uh, without actually having a separate simulation model running developed separately. And it also uh, sort of touches upon your second question about how to make the simulation results more accessible to the policymakers. But we are hoping that then to improve the visualization part of the, of the simulation results, also linking to the MS. So that's a, there is, yes, there is a plan. But uh, we are start. We just we are starting to look into the more in this year, and hopefully we can and have more partners to work on. Yes, thank you. I think yeah, no, exactly. I will, I will just comp complement it. I think Excel is friendly to use. I mean, to develop, and especially when it comes to the target setting. Uh, but sometimes it could be very heavy. For example, in the case of Senegal, where you need to integrate all the detailed activities of the action plan. Maybe having all the software would be okay, but that need to be really, you know, analyzed and studied before going in, mm -hmm. because the advantage of Excel is it's almost open, and you can just, you know, set targets up and down throughout the iterative process. But for now, we don't have plan to move away from from Excel. Okay, on top of that, the advantage of Excel is it's free and accessible for everybody in the world and especially for people from developing countries where you know software access sometimes could be could be heavy so for, yeah, so we continue we will continue to use excel for this at, uh, at the same time we start exploring possibilities linking some of the functions to more of the database software and web based probably not i can't really think of at the moment but then with the database maybe thank you Thank you, Sato Kwan Usman. Well, um, the last question is for Blaise, and it's about the data situation in DRC, which is quite challenging, um, with education data produced through the ME system not being consistent, consistently uh, uh, generated and published, uh, so, um, and also the population data being quite outdated. And so, basically DRC facing challenges of timeliness, coverage of data. So how did you overcome these challenges for informing your model? What were your tricks for, for, for feeding the model? Thank you. Thank you, Raphael, for the question. Yes, these challenges are a reality, we have faced them for data, for demographics, that's inevitable. The census, last, the last census was done 30 years ago, so we go from projection to projection. Even our projections with Enos do not enable us to go beyond that. That's why we went back to the UN projections. That's a fact. And it's exogenous to the educational system. We are living with it, hoping that things will go better and will be better for the country. The INES is working on this to give us new censuses for schooling data. This is uh, another issue. And this is the reason for which we have tried 
to use data in the same way for all the levels in the system, which means all ministries had different speeds for data. We didn't have the data for all the same years for all the ministries. So we have used data that were older, 2014-2015, rather than using data that were more recent. This is an issue, a true issue, and right now, and we have these issues, they're still there, there is only one ministry that has 2018-2017 data, no data for 2019, other ministries have data for 2016, and other ministries even before that, before 2015, so that's the issue with data. This is what we saw in the sector review, uh, that we had an issue with data, and the issue is very real. We presume that we will go beyond these and they will be solved this year. Thank you. Thank you, Blast. All the questions mainly related to um, the capacities needed to run simulation models and to use them. But I think we can address that in the second summit, uh, webinar that we're going to have in March when we're going to discuss the actual applications and, and what it's changed in terms of driving um, um, a more informed policy dialogue among partners, also having uh, successful applications in terms of research mobilization and all of this. So we can, we can take that question of capacities forward in the second, seminar, in the second webinar. Um, I will close now the, this webinar and I will thank very warmly all our presenters um, from DRC, Uganda, Senegal, and from Paris, uh, IEP and uh, UNESCO. And so thank you so much for um, everyone who connected online. Um, as usual, we will uh, circulate uh, a note with the PowerPoints, the recordings, etc. And we'll keep you posted on the next uh, date 